Kickstarter's relevance in the gaming industry? Let's talk about it. Hello and welcome to Triangle Square, the PlayStation Podcast. I'm your host, Brett Beck, and alongside me, a sickly, I think we all are kind of in our area, but ever so fresh in his own little weird way, Mr. Saw Bridges with Lucky Episode 149. Is it lucky that you're stopped up? No. I don't think so either. Hey, you're doing better than Kyrie. She woke up last night at like 12 o'clock with an earache that we didn't get to go back to bed till around 2. Oh, that's fun. So, you know, could be worse. Uh, anyway, if this is your first time joining us, we are a PlayStation-based podcast, so we do talk about uh, the competition and not only the publishing side, but the likes of EA, Ubisoft, and what we see them do that we'd like to see Sony do with their publishing, uh, but also, of course, the competition they have in the manufacturing uh, sector with Microsoft and Nintendo and what we'd like to see them do that we see the other competition doing, what we'd like to see them avoid that we see the competition doing. Uh, so, of course, we do talk about everything. Don't um, forget to mention Google Stadia. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, the the biggest competitor of all, Google Stadia. Uh, no, or st- Stadia. St- is that's a, a Stadia. It's a fancy. It's a fancy. It's like Tarjay. Mm, fancy. Stadia. Um, actually, it does sound fancier. I love to get breaded, salted, doughy concoctions at Tarjay. Mm. That's a fancy way of saying nasty pretzels at Target. Mm. Their, pretzels, okay. their pretzels taste like a bathroom floor. I know that my wife, at least, loves the popcorn there. But I don't know. I mean, it's hard to mess up. You are talking about the little food court. Thing, yeah, right? it's yeah. hard to mess up popcorn. It should be. It, it should be. But some people still find a way, so. It's true. That if caramel to it. If you want to listen to us, though, you can on uh, podcast services, be it Google Play, iTunes, uh, Spotify, Podbean, all those different apps. Uh, if you want to watch us and see our, our set and, and our watch our ugly faces as we ramble on, then you can go over to YouTube and uh Speak for yourself. Find us. Yeah, I'm sorry. Saul's beautiful. I'm not, but that's okay. Um, anyway, you can find us over on YouTube. Uh, if you like what we're talking about, go down in the comments. Let us know your thoughts on any of the subjects that we're talking about or take place, uh, take part rather in the community's take segment where at the end of every episode, we pose a question to the community and at the beginning of the following episode we go back over it and uh, kind of get the input of the community uh, and if you'd like to do that we of course you can do it on there or you can go to our social medias where you can find us which is triangle squared um twitter is at triangle sqrd the facebook group is triangle squared a playstation podcast or of course you can always find us in our discord uh where you can kind of talk to us day to day i've been very busy lately so discord has not been very much in my wheelhouse um, this last week has sucked for both of us i think it has and i think for both reasons it's primarily work yeah but that's okay it's why we do this to escape work and have fun doing things that we enjoy doing so with that said, we got to start this show off the right way. Before we get into the length of the show, as always, of course, um, where we're going to be talking about one of Saul's most lamented things, I think, in his opinion on Kickstarter, and of course, my opinion on Kickstarter as it's it relates half, to the gaming half, industry. Half. Oh, it's a love-hate relationship. Yeah. Okay, well, we're going to learn about that. But before we do, this show starts off in a nice, cordial, friendly manner, since I don't get to see my friend as much as I'd like. And that's, uh, Saul, what you been up to? What you been playing? What you been doing? Any of that stuff. The majority that I've played this week, it's only been like one or two nights out of this week, was Red Dead Online. I played one night with Ryan, and I know we and you hopped at a party that same night. But other than that, like I got back like yesterday, kind of woke up and I wasn't feeling great. I didn't really feel like going like out and about to do anything like I normally do on Saturdays. So I just thought like I uh, I'm gonna go to my comfort game of Dark Souls three and try to do a like a full like sp- not speed run but I guess kind of speed run. It's like a speed run that's not a competitive one. I guess like it's just gonna be it's beat my personal best. So oh, but I, not beat like a posted best. From yeah, else. no, I'm not. No, but yeah. So I did that yesterday, which was fun. Um, actually, I did. I've been kind of wanting to play like a multiplayer game. And I have like modern warfare and stuff like that to play, but I haven't really been wanting to play Call of Duty. So something else, uh, they kind of, they kind of, I remembered was actually kind of fun and I don't really remember why I stopped playing it. And that was apex legends. So like, I kind of started playing apex legends again and I was reminded of how well, uh, respawn can do movement systems and stuff within like the Titanfall universe. 
because that game's really fun. But it's you know, it's one of, that game is technically considered part of the Titanfall universe. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's to me, it's it's one of those things, or at least I think it is. But um, I think you're right. It is one of those things, though, like with battle royale games that I can only play like one or, or two or three matches at a time because it, it's just one of those things that takes so long to set up as you're playing, you know, getting your loadout and stuff and then dying and then having to restart and do it over again. And that might have been why I got, like, I stopped playing the first time once I got burnt out. But other than that this week, those are the three games I've only really played. Uh, I didn't, I haven't played Slade the Spire anymore. I'm still kind of giving myself a break on that. So, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I actually intended to start Greedfall yesterday, and I purchased it digitally, but I wasn't feeling great. I didn't feel like jumping into something like that. Yeah, I mean, I can see that. Jump into something that's a known quantity where you don't feel like your sickness is going to hamper your ability to take it in at all. Yeah. Yeah, I really do. I hope you end up enjoying Greedfall. It's uh, one of those games that everyone that I have recommended it to so far has really enjoyed it. And that's good. I, I always like to hear that my recommendations. I really honestly try not to recommend a game, like wholeheartedly recommend to very many people because I don't want people to feel like they're spending money on something that was based off of my own likes. Because so, everybody's different. But, you know, a, as much as I will, I can recommend somebody to look at a game and see if it interests them and then get it. But in turn, there's a few people where I'm like, I really, really think because of knowing your preferences, I think you'd love this game. So I'm, I'm curious to see. Uh, Donovan ended up loving it after I was talking to him about it. He's like, that sounds really good. He got it and he enjoyed it. How so, long is the game? Like 30 hours? Yeah, 30, 40 hours. Okay. Just okay. depending How on what you do. How open-ended is it? Like it's an open-world game. It's not really open-world. It's like it's – I mean, it is and it isn't. It's, it's like uh, hub-based linear? It's like it's, it's like it's an open-world, but you're just loading between each of the areas. But Outer they're pretty worlds. big. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's, that's but, fine. But instead of it being planets, it's just a bunch of areas within it. But, yeah, yeah. No, it, it still feels more open, and there's still quests and stuff within that. Um, I mean, it's clearly one of the sacrifices they had to make as a double A game, but I don't think the upside is like I brought up back when I was playing it. One of the things you'll find is that they at least use it to good effect to where when you're loading between areas, you have a camp spot where you can actually go through, change party members, buy and sell stuff at a guaranteed store. That's always in this little, the camps, the, 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 the in-between spot always looks the exact same, but that's not really, it, it, it's a moment for you to put stuff in your chest, get anything out of your chest. Can you play the game solo without NPCs? I don't think so. Oh. I, I I didn't choose to do so. If you can, can uh like do your NPCs constantly talk to you and stuff? It just depends on what's going on. Okay, because that's but they have th- their own backstories, very similar to what the Outer Worlds did, where you can go through and you'll see a, a mark nope. come over their head. And you know, I, I was automatically thinking of the game that annoyed me, which was Dr- uh, Dragon's Dogma, having the NPCs walk around and constantly talking to you and stuff. No, it's not like that. I mean, you know, I said, I mean, did you ever have a single NPC with you in in um? The Outer Worlds? No, I played that game entirely solo. Okay, so you didn't even get Parvati for that little bit? Or no, just, okay. no. I, I think, like, you're talking about the mission, that, like, that was one beginning. of the very first missions that you talked to the guy and the uh, the mayor, I think is who mm-hmm. it was. And then he was, and then she was like, I can come, I could come with you. And you send her back to the garage or whatever. And I just never went to the okay, garage. Okay, gotcha. All right, well, I was just curious. Um, I don't think, it, it was not a problem for me. Uh, now, there are cutscenes where they interrupt. Uh, no, I won't say interrupt. There are cutscenes, and I actually think that this is pretty ambitious for a game from this of this size from the studio. Uh, there are cutscenes and things that change based on who you have in your party and the, re- and the interactions that go through it. So, like, a really early example is you come across, because the game has kind of got um, these Inquisitor-style people, you come across one who is uh, trying to burn... Uh, one of the natives because of their pagan relief beliefs and all that and their devils and demons and whatnot. And if you have uh, the native tribe girl, and I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but uh, if you have her in your party, the cutscene interacts completely different where if you don't have her, the cutscene is more or less the same because it's someone who's essentially just going, ah, you know, this is kind of just par for the course and it's not affecting me personally. Whereas her, she's got stock in it. So it actually changes the way the cutscene plays out. And there's a lot of different cutscenes that can be affected by who you have in your party. Gotcha. Which I, I like that kind of stuff. It yeah. makes it feel like every playthrough is ultimately going to be Slightly. the same basic story, yeah. but you're going to have slight, differences depending on how you've chosen to either because your party members if i'm not mistaken can leave if you do not 
talk to them or attend them. They can start to hate you and I, eventually leave. I was actually just saying, uh, reading a comment, uh, and it, it doesn't seem possible unless you bench all of them, which I don't know what that means. Me. But uh, they said you could always make everybody hate you. So I guess that's what they mean is like you can. If you ignore, leave. like you'll see them have a quest and they'll talk to you about it, and you can kind of be like, hey, well, let's do it now, or hey, don't have quite the time right now, but I'll do it as soon as I have the chance. But, you know, if you just ignore it forever, then they'll start getting mad at you. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, hope you enjoy the game. Definitely a, a good time. But If anything, uh, it'll just make me want to play Divinity 2 again. <laughs> I love that game. <laughs> well, in case you didn't realize, uh, I didn't get on Red Dead Friday, as we talked about. <laughs> oh, dude, I felt so bad like, by the time I got off work on Friday. You weren't like, even worried about it? No. Like, I forgot, I forgot a majority of Friday night because I went home. I took a nap. Uh, I woke up. Me and Annie got Chick-fil-A. I ate that. Took a nap on the couch at like eight and woke up at midnight and just went and got in bed. Mm. And she actually ended up having to work yesterday, which is her off day normally. And um, I ended up taking a nap at like four to five. And I kind of just played Apex and Red Dead a majority of the day while watching YouTube videos. Mm. All right, then. You've just been endlessly resting, but that's not a bad thing. No. Well, hopefully we'll all get to feeling better. Our weather doesn't want to make up its mind. Hey, look at that. <laughs> Somebody wanted Yorha, and or not Yorha. It's not even Yozora. That's Riku. Yozora. Yeah, but yeah, that's I. I don't even know why I said the name wrong. Once again, I'm foggy minded. Well, Yozora oh, no. kind of looks like Riku. Not really. <clears throat> I, yeah, I can see it either way. Uh, but that's cool. Um, I played, of course. Uh, let's see, Sea of Solitude. I started that up, and I talked about that uh, since our last episode. It's been a while back now since we did that early in the can episode. Uh huh. Um, so we did the early in the can episode for the weekend. That you oh, had. yeah. So it's been a while since we've recorded. Uh, I started Sea of Solitude on uh, EA Access, uh, or I got it from EA Access and started it. Uh, very good. Uh, it's one of those perfect examples. The game's not overly long. It doesn't overstay its welcome. It knows what it's trying to achieve, and it does that. Saul dropped his jewel. That's not a jewel. But that's also, uh, I was going to ask you, is there anything plugged into this white thing over here? You can plug it in over there. Oh. But no, you can also unplug the white thing. You're fine. Gotcha. Back on top. All right. Anyway, um, Sea of Solitude, very good. It's one of those games that I think the thematic nature of it comes into every little shape and form. The music absolutely abs uh, um, accents it perfectly. The style of the game, I think, is really good and, and, and or really fitting for what's going on. Uh, the basic premise of the story, for anybody who may be interested, is that you're a girl named Kay. And okay. you're a monster. <laughs> uh, you you are a monster as you see yourself. Essentially, this is like a game that's almost taking place within your own mind, and it's like you're seeing yourself as a monster, and you're going through and looking at things that have changed. Um, I don't want to say it's taking place in your mind. It's hard to say, but it's clearly not on normal Earth. You know, it's kind of like you're taking a trip and seeing a very abstract view of somebody viewing themselves through a lens and how it's affected the world around them. That is, I'm going to spoil a game that I hate. That is relatively new. So if you guys don't care about Blair Witch, don't play that trash game. Um, I looked up at, like how that game ended. It was you the entire time. And it's kind of a similar thing. Oh, well, this is not like that. Thank oh, you. I know. But yeah, it's this, still kind of like is, the whole camera just, was you looking through a different kind of like the thing. Oh, okay. Well, either way, uh, this game's take don't, don't, on all don't waste this your time on Blair Witch. That game's trash. Has been very interesting. And I, I loved it, honestly. The only thing that I, it bums me out is I'm very close to Platinum. Uh, just naturally, I'm a blind playthrough, but the story does not have uh, collectible tractors. Like the the game doesn't. Uh, so the, the few collectibles I missed, and I mean like a few, I don't know where they are. The order did that to me. So I'd essentially have to replay the whole game. I think I missed two collectibles, and thankfully they were fairly in the early game. But I don't think Order had collectible tracking. Neither did um, Hellblade. A lot of games have not. Yeah, Hellblade, I think I got everything but one on my first time. And it was also something early. Or maybe I did get everything on my first one. Because like, I paid... I've, I, I I scoured every little corner of Hellblade. That was a very fun game I did to the scour. same of Sea of Solitude. And uh, either way, the game is great. And I think it's cheap enough that if you get a chance to play it, or if you have EA access, five dollars a month, five dollars you can play just that game, even within that one month. I think it's well worth it. Uh, go check it out. It's one of those examples of when somebody who's in this medium or in any medium really is what I love about this understands interesting ways to use metaphors and definitely, I think, 
games do have a very specific thing because their metaphors get to rest on you interacting with things. So it, it, because music and movies all have to do it from the standpoint of you cannot affect the pacing or story or anything yourself, you're not going to interact with the action that's going through. And I know it's minor, but there really is something about tying you in with somebody because you are essentially acting as them and seeing a world through their prism. Whereas a movie... You can, there are movies that try and, and, and try and be like, well, we're gonna. You're looking at this from the scope of one person. Um, it was like Hardcore Henry or something that chose to be first person. Yeah, Hardcore I, Henry I was, was the name of that entirely movie. first person, if I'm not mistaken. So it's not that movies. <clears throat> it's not that it's impossible. I just think that games obviously have the benefit of it working out more often, even in a third person situation where you're playing as the character. You can talk about other things where you're viewing something through the okay well you can look at this show and you're viewing the show through the world of all these characters well games are a lot more interesting because a lot of games choose to follow one protagonist and even though you see everything else you're really seeing everything through their lens whereas tvs and movies will often change it where well now you're seeing it through the other person's lens there are movies that do it like joker i think of of course is you're you're looking at something uh, the whole movie it kind of seems like it's his perspective on everything. You're never, even though there's other people around, the movie is primarily focused on him and him alone and how the moments around him are going. This game is really good at pulling off, giving you the idea of control over the, over the situation, but letting you go through and see and feel different things. And I feel like it's one of those things where gameplay mechanics can try and come back in to the thematic standpoint and give you a feeling of what's going on. Um, I'm, I'm trying to be careful with what I say because I really think it's one of those games where you don't want to spoil anything about it. I'm just trying to give you a basic setup. And uh, it, it was it's a game that I honestly I remember seeing and being impressed by at EA's um, E3 that they did. I think it was 2018 so they showed it off. Um, and then I it was Microsoft they showed it off, wasn't it? I didn't think so. I mean, it, it might have been. I thought it was EA's. Um, no, wait. I'm thinking of something else. I'm thinking of that other cute game that was made by um, Lotus. Uh, I can't think of the full name of that studio. Oh, Thunder Lotus. Thunder Lotus. Yes, yeah. That, that was, was also 2019. Yeah. Um, either way, Sea of Solitude, great game. Go check it out. I'd forgotten about it in a sense until... Um, what is his Twitter handle? SGT Stainedraj or something like that. Sorry if I'm butchering the the name, uh, but he had he had won um, one of our cards during the Twelve Days of Christmas, and he got um, the game, and it made me think about. it. I said, I have EA access already. I might as well just play it while I have the chance. And very good, I enjoyed it. A but lot. before we go into our community's take, um, I am going to do something I've, I've rarely done where I've said I've, I've made plans to uh, to play a game that I'm going to announce and we'll see how well this works but a game caught my eye that got added to games pass and it's going to be the third time I've tried to play and get into this game the witcher no I already had that game downloaded I'll say I mean it's on the this game, game I actually the, the witcher I never I never disliked to an extent, like I, I dis—I didn't dislike it, but I didn't enjoy my time with it. But I didn't have anything against the game, okay. Other than the problems I had with it, but it wasn't in like a um, a personal sense or negative sense due to the nature of The Witcher. But on the other hand, when you have Final Fantasy fifteen, oh yeah, who put shame to the series <laughs> with what the game launched in? Mm -hmm. They added the Royal Edition, yes, which is the highest edition that you can get digitally. That is supposed to be the now complete package. It's the highest ranking military. Sorry. It is, it's something like it's that. It's just the way that you were saying it. It is the general of the of the Final Fantasy terrible games. But, I thought um, it was just the the rebranding of it when they released it with um, you know like that was when they released it on PC and then they came back through and did the royal update on the stuff. Either way, I, I really, had, well the royal update had a lot of bug fixes and if I'm not mistaken, I think the royal edition didn't include DLC character stories. I don't think so, but it might. Oh dear, maybe not then. But even then, I don't think, I mean, I think a lot of it would be, how far did you get in that game? Did you beat it? Uh, no, I got to the, the nice city. I didn't think you did. Okay, that's why I was wanting to be sure. Yeah. Uh, I, and I vaguely remember the end because I just had Joe tell me but because I didn't care, but I kind of forgot most of it. So yeah. Uh, what is that name of that big city, the nice one, um, where you go initially to find Sarah? Oh. Um, the big, nice, watery city. It's mm -hmm. like white. Like everything's like, like almost like white porcelain in my mind. Yeah, it's killing me that I can't remember the name of that place. But, um, but yeah, I got there. So I would say, what is that? About a third of the way through. It's about twenty-ish hours in. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Altissia. Altissia. That's mm -hmm. right. 
So all it so this comes with all new dungeons, armager unleashed, um, the royal vessel vessel which is a boat, seasonal pass content. So yeah, episode Gladiolus, episode Prompt Two, multiplayer comrades, episode Ignis, over a dozen pieces of DLC including weapons, regalia, car skins, and item sets. The and the I like how the last thing is the critically acclaimed game Final Fantasy Fifteen. <laughs> like really now this does this this the royal edition comes with a game. Um, you know, if that's actually, if that is on Games Pass, I will probably play the DLC editions then. Yeah. I thought it was just normal Final Fantasy 15. It still bothers, the, it still bothers the hell out of me that a lot of that stuff should have been included at launch, but I under, I, I understand like the game was delayed so many times and it oh, took eight years actually, to come out. That's the other side I was going to say is, uh, I've, I've been playing through DLC. So the other game I've been playing actually recently was the Kingdom Hearts Rebind DLC. Yeah. And I'm very similar up until like the end stuff is a hit or miss on it. I think the scenario that you go through and play, that's like the other story that happens during the ending of Kingdom Hearts three. It was cool, but I feel like it should have just been in the base game. See that, and that's uh, it. now the data battles and stuff afterwards. I do feel like at least half of this content could have been in the game because the the general expectation of a Kingdom Hearts game and Final Fantasy even is that you're going to have great end game stuff to do from a hard boss battle standpoint. And Kingdom Hearts just didn't have that. It had one hidden boss that really wasn't that hard. I beat it on my second try, and the first time I barely even messed up. Um, in terms of like, I realized on death, like I'm gonna die, but that's okay. But after that, beat it without even a sweat on the second try. Whereas a lot of these data bosses I've been going through and dealing with, I've had to fight upwards of ten times. Yeah, and it, it it seems like it's a it's a common path right now with Square, which is kind of what it, it still kind of is what pushes me around with Final Fantasy VII is that a lot of their games have been delayed into oblivion lately, and then when they come out, there there's often things that come out not too far after that feel like everything should be included. Yeah, Final Fantasy XV is not the Royal Edition. It's just the game. No, it's Royal Edition. Like, on my Xbox dashboard, they use the Royal Edition, uh, the, the the special, like, it's golden and, I know and you're purple. Talking about yeah. and it has the 15 big it, yeah. behind it. That's what's on the, that's on the Xbox dashboard. Well, that's not what it says right here, so I don't know what to tell you. I will be angry. I don't really think it matters, man. The game is still a lot different than the version that you played. Well, see, and that's, that's kind of what, in a way, it makes me angry. Um... You know, there's there's a, there's a few games that have been fixed since launch that are worth playing now. No Man's Sky being notably the best. Mm-hmm. Um, that shouldn't happen with a Final Fantasy game. And it what's crazy? But it did. And they got at this e- point, at least they tried to fix it. Well, they got everything right stylistically with the game that I love about Final Fantasy. The, the designs of all the characters were spot on and 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 dope. I loved every one of them. There was very, especially um, long silver hair guy. Oh, uh, yeah, Cor... Mm. No, I thought was, didn't his name start with an A? No, it was uh, Sarah's brother. Is that a spoiler? Because I'll kill you. No. I don't remember that. Um, but, yeah, like it, it's one of those things like they had everything down. The combat system was a little samey, but I kind of forgive it because that's kind of what Kingdom Hearts combat system is. Um, but my thing is, is like the story started off like... I, Two hours in the game, I shouldn't be playing a mission or a side mission based around ramen noodles. Like, legitimately, the Hold brand on. You ramen. said Sarah. It's not Sarah. I got that in my head a second ago. But you're, go ahead. Keep going. Sorry. Now now I can't remember what her name is. Um, but, yeah, it, it's, it's just one of those things. Like, I had a lot of issues with the game. And now that it's going to be free, I would, I would not actually um, mind going back and playing it at all like i still own the original version on ps4 so if it's all that is on the xbox then i'll just i'll just i'll play the um that version of my ps4 without downloading it on xbox but i'm willing to give it a second try like i did near but the thing is with near is that i just kind of was disinterested in it after a while and that's kind of one of the reasons i didn't have fundamental issues with some of the parts of the game advertisement in the game was kind of freya yeah, I don't know where I got Sarah. Oh, Sarah's from Final Fantasy thirteen. But thir- yeah, I, I think that, and there was a different name for one of the people during thirteen versus who was essentially who Luna Frey was like being replaced by or replaced. It was that Sarah too. She replaced. I don't remember. Okay, but yeah, this is. Um, You're talking about this dude right here, right? Ravis. Mm, no. Okay, unless you're talking that's about... Not, that's not the guy that's like the anti-hero. I don't know who, what he's going to do in the game. Don't tell me what he's going to do. But when you first meet him, it's when, you get, it's when you're on that military base. Mm-hmm. And he's in the helipad thing, your helicopter thing. And he comes out. He's wearing a hat. Arden? Yes. That's why I said it starts with an A. 
He doesn't have silver hair. Does he not? No, it's like maroon. Oh, okay. Brown. Well, it's 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 like yeah, purpley. Okay, I knew it was, it was a wild color. But yeah, like the character designs of that game are cool. The weapon stuff in that game is cool. The vehicle system of games kind of cool, but kind of like it's not. better now because you can just off road truck it, homie. Well, then that's fine. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's just one of those things that that you know I I had a fundamental problem with when it came out. So now that if this has been fixed in Royal, I'm certainly not paying for Royal Edition. I've already spent sixty dollars. Well, you don't have to pay for the Royal Edition to get the updates. The updates that fix the game are included in just the base game. The Royal Edition just happens to be all of it together. Yeah. So play the game if you want to. Don't if you don't want to. You yeah, know, it's no big deal. You can get it. You can figure it out. But so, well, we can get into the normal topic. We went off Final Fantasy for a little too long there. But people who love Final Fantasy love love that kind of talk. I'm sure. Okay. Right. I hope so. <laughs> I don't know. That game was very. It's funny that both 15. <coughs> excuse me. That both 15 and um, Final. I mean, and Kingdom Hearts three were like somewhat lesser received versions of acclaimed franchises from other games. I mean, I think Final, uh, Kingdom Hearts 3 was better than Final Fantasy 15 at launch, but you know, regardless. So here, here's a article that just says Final Fantasy 15 on Xbox Games Pass for console and PC con- includes all DLC and standalone comrades experience. Hey, I, I hope so. So I don't I'll gladly play it. Oh, this is what pisses me off. The Royal version is the standard version now. There is no base game. Okay. That, that's something in games that makes me angry. This is a single player experience aside from comrades. Don't fix your game and then make that the base game. That should have been the base game from the get go. I, I, I guess. I don't know. I just, are you, is it a complaint from the standpoint of someone can't buy the original version? Of the no, game no, no, no. I'm just saying like what? that, that just goes to show you that the game was so flawed on release that now they're there that, that you can't even buy that version anymore. Essentially. Like it's an outdated version of the game. I don't like that. It's like if I bought, like I'll just throw out, let's, if I bought Horizon and Horizon was a flawed mess at launch. I'm not saying it is, I'm saying hypothetically. And then they ended up fixing it and then Frozen Wilds was the fixed version of it. I don't like that in any game. Multiple games have done that before. This is a single player game. That should never happen. No Man's Sky kind of gets by with it because it I is. I No Man's Sky essentially it's a that. multiplayer. It's, um, it's a multiplayer game now though. And you can kind of argue that with Comrades, it's kind of the same thing. But then again, most people will say No Man's Sky is a um, games of the service. This well, is- look, I'd still say no one's arguing the game should have been in a better state when it launched. But it, I guess to me, and maybe it's not what you're saying, but it comes off to me as like complaining that they bothered to fix the game. Regard, I mean, and you may not be exactly happy with no, how no, they no, did I'm it, not, but I'm, I'm not happy that they fixed it, even if they replaced the old version of it, because all they're doing is it's essentially them taking responsibility and saying, hey, the original version of the game that came out, it's not really what it should have been, so we're not going to even put it out there. Only the version we're going to have now is the Royal. Now, I don't. it depends from a cost standpoint, but I, I still think it's that you can buy Final Fantasy you, 15. But, you're missing my point. I'm not complaining about them fixing the game that way. I'm complaining that... The game was in such a mess at launch that I paid money for that is now that base game is no longer even the same for what I paid now. And then they released it as a as a new standalone thing, or they released all these things that were ten dollars, all this DLC, and then they just included it into the main game now, which is forty dollars. If you were to buy all that when it came out, it'd been a hundred dollars for everything. Now it's forty. Yeah, but every game does that eventually. One of the things the news is going into but is that you can is buy the, Kingdom once, Hearts all together in once one again, for a lot less money this, than what you would have paid when you bought them when series. they first came out. That's literally a series, Well, yeah, though. but this is also a bunch of DLC content that but, is extra on top that's, of the game. That's, that's what I'm mad about. This DLC content is what should have been in the game from the get-go. I don't know about that. The game was still plenty of length. You were just it agreeing been better with me a minute ago. It. No, I'm saying that the game had issues at launch. Bugs, uh, some half-written areas that they went through and fixed that are not even part of the DLC, just half-written yeah. areas, like Chapter 13, if I remember what it was, was one that they wanted to go back which oddly enough, I actually enjoyed. Wasn't it had that like a Resident people, Evil horror game experience? You never got there. I know, but wasn't that what people called the missing chapter? Kinda. It was like it was written in a way that you understood what was going on if you looked around the map. But a lot of people, I guess, just didn't. There was a lot of papers that would kind of tell you what was going on, and you learned a lot. But people wanted something that was a little more involved, and I think that that's fine. But my point being is, I think that there's things about the game they fix, like the vehicle being able to go around the whole thing, being bug on a rail issues, system in a way. all these different things. They've made the base version of the game a lot better. I don't have any problem with them coming back through and saying, "Hey, now for forty dollars, you can get all the DLC as well." Almost 
almost every game does that, a complete edition. And to me, it doesn't bother me that a complete edition exists of this game. It's because the base only. game still got fixed. So even even though so did you buy the base version of the game digitally? Yes. You can go play it right now on PS4 in the best possible version of the base game. Is that true though? Yes, absolutely, it's true. We'll go. To, we'll go to PS4. That's, that's, and that's and why see. I'm confused as to what you're going. It's not saying that the Royal Edition is only the extra content. It has nothing to do. You can't buy the base game anymore, but that's fine. All they're saying is if you own the base game, it still got updated. The base game is included in the Royal Edition. All you're getting is the same game. But I'm getting in the all the Royal DLC. Edition. Yeah, sure. So do I get all the for DLC ex- for this? No. Well, so why th- would you? Because it's extra content they made later. Whether or not you agree with the fact they had to do that, it is extra content made later. I bought Remind for 30 I wish it would have been 20 and some of the content I wish was in the game. But it's not. And at least they made well, it see, later, and, and I didn't have to choose but Square Enix is getting so predictable that I guarantee you within the next six months that oh. there'll be Kingdom Hearts 3 will be $50, with sure. Remind included. I don't oh. like that. Like, Oh, well, right now we can go ahead and, and spoil one of the new things. You can get the Kingdom Hearts story so far and Kingdom Hearts 3 all together in one package for forty nine ninety nine. Now, ironically, Remind's not in there. Well, the story for, so far includes the games, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's every Kingdom Hearts game, including that, three. That, see, that, But though, it's called the all-in-one package, but the irony is that even though it's all-in-one package, it doesn't include Remind. Yeah. But, Th- oh, well. That though, that, though, is okay in my eyes, because, once again, those this these are full experiences that you're getting collectively sure. for a good deal. What this is, what, what, what the Royal Edition is, is a, and rightfully so, but a fixed version of the game. By the way, this is the new topic of the show. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> but it's a it is, topic show. It is the it is the fixed version of the game that you get for forty dollars. But but th- but it's not the fixed version of the base game. That's 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 and I mean I'm maybe not, it's I'm just not, a disagreement on what that is. But that, that's eyes, essentially where it ends for me. You're not paying. You're not having to pay anything more to play the fixed and updated version of the base game. Right. And, that, and that's but everybody who bought all these extra characters afterwards are now screwed. They're not screwed. They just they got the they spent a hundred dollars in the game for sixty dollars more. Yeah, it's than a game it. that came out four years ago. I mean, pretty much. But that's the thing. Like that bothers me in a Final Fantasy game. If this is a games as a service thing, imagine this: No Man's Sky came out, and then now all the oh, No Man's Sky stuff costs ten dollars as it comes out. Mm-hmm. Would that have been right? No. I mean, I I wouldn't say it'd been wrong. It just I mean, it's yeah, better than yeah. They, I, I, I would have said it was wrong. You I don't pay have. sixty dollars for a game that you get as an incomplete mess with bugs, frame rate issues, missing no, missing parts that. of the story, and then you sell DLC chapters for characters for ten, fifteen dollars a piece, whatever they were. But they and, still fixed the base game. They went back and fixed it for everyone else. I know, but once again, like that's the thing. I think we're just arguing to points that we just don't agree. I mean, and that's fine. I think we're just going to call this and agree to disagree. I guess so. I think to me, you're going into a too much of a nitpick. I'm not. It's not a nitpick. It's it's when you launch a game at sixty dollars, brand new, and it has problems with it, and then these problems get fixed months and months after the road, while they're releasing DLC characters that cost money mm-hmm. for these problems for a story that is technically finished as of then. Like everybody up until then, like that would have been a good incentive to give the DLC characters for free, or just update the game with those characters and those stories for free, like No Man's Sky did. I mean, they could have, and if they would have, I would have. I but would we're have seeing, a, them. But, but the whole point of this is we're seeing a trend here with Square Enix. You see a, a game delayed for five plus years. You get a game at launch that does not feel as the, as the experience should have. And I think we both can say that about Kingdom Hearts three, like what you said with Remind, feel like it should have been included with some of the things. Both about of them it. could have been better, but I thought both of them were fine, complete stories that you could play through start to finish without any major bugs or anything. And I could say they could have been better. I could say both Absolutely. if I decide to, if I finished Final Fantasy, but for sure for me, Kingdom Hearts, like Kingdom Hearts, was a fantastic game. No man, like I mean, not no man, no ne- nowhere near like Game of the Year material or anything like that. But it, it was, was still good. a good game. Yeah. Um, Remind being launched, I'm not gonna play Remind. I don't think. Um, but we see a game announced. Three years later, we get a delay for two more years or whatever it may be on average. Game comes out, then we see DLC added to it. It's becoming a trend with Square Enix that I don't agree with. Mm-hmm. I don't like. I don't. I like. think that's fair enough. I just don't think it, that that's where we agree is that it's a trend I'd like to see them buck. But in terms of you, you know, there's nothing about buying the rest of the stuff that detracts from the base version of the game still being playable. And they went back through and updated both Kingdom Hearts 3 to have extra content that wasn't there at launch. Um, uh, and things like uh, the, the critical mode that they but added see, to the game. And then that version added uh, the ability to switch between every character besides just Noctis. In the base version of the game now, you can switch during combat to, uh, you can be Ignis, you can be Prompto, uh, you can be Gladiolus in those moments, and then you can go back. 
Uh, they've added extra car stuff. Essentially, they poured some of that money back into making sure that people got the base version of the game at least ended up with a better final But what product. about all the people who have already played and finished the game that weren't enjoyed with it? Well, like, they got the game early. They, and, I mean, they, don't worry, they, it's, it's unfortunate. Early. It's not early. I'm not saying early. Yeah, they got the game earlier than the other people who came around and bought it later, maybe for less money, maybe with more content for less money. But it's just every medium exists in that way in some shape or form. There are versions of movies that come out with extra content that even though you paid for it in a the theater, it comes out on DVD with 30 minutes of extra scenes and that maybe make the movie better. It's unfortunate that it happens, but it's not anything crazy in the industry. In, an, in a really ideal world and situation where money was not really a, an object, it would be great if it came out at no extra cost. I'm not, I wouldn't have given them hell for that. I'm not, but I'm also not going to give them hell for what it is. I mean, it's unfortunate, but it's not the end of the world because at least they went back and, and at least they didn't do this. This is, this is basically what I'm saying. They could have only given the fixes for the base version of Final Fantasy 15 if you bought Royal Edition, but they didn't. The, the, the game that people bought day one still got updated to be better than it was at launch to at least try and make up for it. And that's essentially where the end of it is for me. I mean, yeah, but like we said before with No Man's Sky, if, if, if it would have been charged at any of a price... Then, it would have been worse received, and the game probably wouldn't have survived. And that's that's all I'm saying with Final Fantasy is that that's essentially what happened. They they added DLC and stuff to the game, and I, I'm 99 percent sure when the first character DLC came out, wasn't it Ignis? I think so. Okay, yeah, there were still problems in the game, yeah. and, and I remember seeing people being angry about that. Oh, by the way, you know what's really messed up? I bought this game digitally. Okay. I can't download this game again. Yeah, you can. How? Let's go to purchases. It'll, it'll be or go to library you'll find the game so i can't search it on the store you don't have to i mean you can i don't know if the store on the website will give you your library but on your system you just go to library let's see i was I'm, i was gonna be really bad no you don't you own the game i guarantee it but i want to move on because we've been stuck on yeah. this one for a little bit uh before we go into the news we're gonna go ahead and hit off our community's take like we always do the community's take of course last week's episode was about whether or not uh we would see the PS5 sometime soon with all the rumors, go rumors going around. So the community state question was, now that we're in February, do you think we will hear anything substantial about the PS5 this month as countless rumors have suggested? Why or why not? Over on Discord, uh, our patron and good bud, Mr. Josh, said, I think we will get a big info drop, and I do think it's the 29th. It may be a Saturday, but it's a leap day. One comes every four years, so why not try to make it a thing? I don't think we won't get a price... Oh, I do think we won't get a price, uh, but I think most else is fair game. Have a reveal, then maybe two state of plays through the year, announcing the launch games, uh, lineup, price, and maybe some teases for other games. I say February, show all the features, controller and box, maybe two to three launch or launch window games, maybe some third-party titles, studio acquisitions, then state of plays with one big game and indie slash VR news or announcements. Um, you know? I actually kind of love the idea of them taking advantage of the leap year and being like, guess what? Our PlayStation 5 reveal event is going to be on the leap year day. Because it would be one of those funny things where the anniversary of your reveal only comes once every four years. That would be kind of cool. <laughs> but the I, I think that that's interesting. Now, the 29th, eh, you know, we'll see. We'll see. We have a, we have plenty of weeks left for them to still announce a very late February reveal uh, and, and get stuff out there. We will find out how that goes down. Uh, one more that's over on Discord is Mr. El Jabib, our longtime listener, says there was a great point said during the latest podcast about how PlayStation is very different about messaging this gen. From skipping E3 altogether, not having PSX lately, State of Play, and the Wired articles, it's been an interesting following them all through this so if they end up skipping the whole showcase of the console and just another wild article or something similar, I wouldn't be surprised. Hell, showing it as a state of play would, pl would boost that venue in terms of legitimacy a lot across the media and give it the oomph it needs as a platform to have huge announcements. This may even convert it from a normal direct to something that is anticipated every time it comes up. Uh, and, you know, I did actually mention that. We, we very well could see them continue to just go with wired articles throughout the rest of this. And that's how they choose to give this information out mixed in with state of place. But you know, I think that the, the showing out of state of play, do you think that would tie into what you uh, like about directs and what you were hoping from state of play? Are you okay? Would you be okay with that happening and kind if, of changing the way the, state of plays go? If the wired articles came out later than the state of play did and then, or, or, or after I should say not later and then had more info, 
than the state of play. So say they say the state of play gives us a an announcement on specs or something, but then the Wired article goes more in depth, straight from somebody from Sony. That'd be cool. Okay, I could see that. I, I do think there's something about it. It would definitely have an impact on helping state of play, but would that impact stay? Because if they do it once, but they can't keep the momentum up, which is who knows, then you run into the same problem of getting one big one out that's really good and then ruining that momentum by the next one not being able to keep up. Now, of course, going into a new generation, there's plenty of stuff you can show, but then you run into the problem that Saul and I have had at, at various stages of where they show stuff just way too early and you don't see it for another three years, even though they just, just chose to say, hey, new console's coming, and on this new console, we have plans for uh, a Resistance reboot. But guess what? We're not going to see the Resistance reboot for another three years because so the game's going to be constantly in development because we showed it just as soon published by Square Enix. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. What, what, um, one little quick thing to go back on here, though. It is in my download list as a game. Yeah. But if I click on it. It won't happen on your PlayStation, though. Well, no, I can download it here. Yeah, but I'm saying you were you were correct in the fact that the base game is now the Royal Edition. There is no more base game. Yeah, they've they've replaced the base right. game with the Royal. So edition. I get all the bug fixes, but I don't get all that content. Yes, and that that's what I'm mad about. Game of the Year editions and stuff like that that come with everything is one thing, but replacing the base game is something else. Yeah, plenty of games do it. I don't, but you know, maybe it's just a game I've never been so salty to get the all, all the content for, and I don't want to pay problem. again. Yeah. yeah. I mean, who knows? Uh, anyway, over on Facebook, a couple more. Uh, Mr. Ken Nay said, I think we will hear something either in February or March. I think they want the info to be public before GDC, and I think they want to get the details out before they start to heavily promote The Last of Us 2, which actually is interesting. You do start running in later in the year when Sony's games start popping back in. You do run in them trying to promote a big game for the current gen of consoles, while also, if they wait, having to balance that alongside trying to get people excited for the next generation of consoles. Does that mean it's impossible, considering that the next gen will play all these games? But it's it's a mixed... I, I'm curious on that one. Uh, one of the things that came up after we recorded, since this is recorded uh, over a week and a half ago at this point, uh, which is not normal for our recording situation, but the PS5 uh, website went live, and you can click on it, and the site specifically says... PS5 coming soon, not quite ready to talk about it. S uh, paraphrasing, but that's essentially what it is. We're not quite ready to get, share more details. Now, that's been taken two ways by a lot of different people. That's been either set up as, hey, the site went live, and this is them saying that you're not going to see something for a while, and that's what the message of we're not quite ready to share everything is. Uh, so it's going to be a while before we see it. Then the other group of people are looking at it and saying, well, yeah, they're putting this up there and it's a standalone message for like a week or two before we end up getting the reveal. And it, this is just a signal fire for an incoming announcement. Uh, I think I see both sides of it. But it's, yeah, I the don't fact know. they include that little statement at the end of that website that saying that we we do not anticipate on making any announcements at this time kind of makes me think that it's going to be longer than this month. Well, and I see that, but I do think other people are going to see it as not in that this time. Well, at this time, two weeks is still not at this time. You don't know. And I'm not saying two weeks is everyone's answer. It's just I see how some people are viewing it, but it could also just be. I mean, it very well could be that it's later and everybody's just so biting at the at, at the thing, which actually I'm going to bounce over to Twitter real quick. Uh, one of the one of our longtime friends and and buddies that we're playing Red Dead with. We're going to do that some more. But uh, Mr. Ryan says, yes, because if Sony wants the internet to not burn down, they will say something. PS5 news is at a fever pitch. Every time PlayStation tweets, and this is true, just look through the replies. It's hilarious. Every single tweet that PlayStation has put out, it's a thread of constant, when do we see PS5? What about that PS5, though? PS5 news, question mark? it's almost like they're I, I really think people are trying to goad Sony into going ahead and being like fine we're gonna tell you everything you want to know because it's just like yeah we know that you, you we know that you came out with this game but that game doesn't matter we're worried about the big news what's up with the big news um so I, I do think that there's definitely something to the idea that that's going on but uh back over on Facebook real quick and we'll pull another couple of these uh, Mr. Derek Porter says I think we'll be seeing something substantial this month they know that people are anxious and they need to get the hype started early the new Xbox has had mixed reactions if Sony is smart they would take advantage of that and really drive the excitement until release I do think that there's a good point made there regardless of the fact that Xbox has beat them out of the gate 
it has been met with a little bit of mixed reception on specifically the box. If Sony has the ability to, and they do have a box that's more universally liked than the Xboxes, they really could come out and make a big dent in Xbox and get themselves a kind of running start. And from what we saw throughout all of the PS4 build up and generation, that was something they were keen on doing. Are they still keen on doing that? Who knows? But it does make sense that it's something they could do. Now, by but they box, may not be ready for that. The physical box of the console. Yeah, well, yeah, the physical console casing, yeah. whatever you want to call that. Because the, the thing about Xbox is uh, it's not been very mixed on what the Xbox can or can't do from a spec standpoint or feature standpoint almost all of the contention comes down to the design of the console itself which is stupid but it is something that comes into this factor so if sony could come out with a with a very sleek sexy looking console design then they do get the added benefit of being even though they're showing later they're showing stronger in in people's eyes who maybe thought the xbox wasn't there if if as long as the net majority like the new box more than the net majority of people who like the the xbox box then it would still be a win for sony in that particular sense but something interesting to note here as much as I think Sony still sees Xbox as competition, Xbox has actually recently stated that they view Amazon and Stadia as their primary competition now. Um, and it kind of goes with what we said. It's like it's going to eventually get, they're going to be so such different companies, it's going to be like Nintendo. You can't really compare you, Nintendo to PlayStation. I mean, you or, can all day long, but, but it's it, just that it, it, it doesn't hold water. It's less pertinent than it really yeah. was. So yeah, that's an interesting thing. I'm going to go bounce off and get one more off Twitter and then we'll move along. Mr. Uh, Matt not Maddie says launching the website has just kept the fire warm on this. I don't think we'll hear anything this month, but we're only a week into February. So Sony could start getting press invites out soon for the end of the month. Who knows? Um, so yeah, it does definitely seem like the interesting thing is that Sony has everybody kind of on ice right now. It's like, everybody's just kind of like, wait a minute, what's going on? What are we going to do? Here's this little thing over here. It's either a, it's either a symbol for a blazing fire hitting soon, or it's just embers that are that are starting off to build up towards something bigger. Who knows? Right. We'll definitely see. Uh, but go ahead and bring over into our news. And the first thing we have up on here is a rumor, but it's a rumor that I put in here because personally I was excited to see it, even though it is a rumor. Uh, and I know there's a lot of people who listen to the show that have expressed interest in this game as well. Biomutant, the long known game from Experiment 101, has been silent for quite some time, but a listing from Instant Gaming shows the game as releasing March 17th for Steam. Now, while this date could be a placeholder, uh, it could be a PC only release date where the game comes out earlier for PCs and it does consoles, which is something we've seen from the same publisher Nordic on uh, the recent um, Darksiders Genesis uh, or if it's the real date it's always best to take this stuff with a grain of salt but I really hope this is true only thing about that is March 17th is not far away from us and I would really expect within the next week to start seeing this release date plastered everywhere and some form of marketing so within the next week if we don't see that I'm probably going to think this is not true probably yeah just a run of the mill rumor yeah at that point Yep, next thing up, PlayStation has decided to close its Manchester game studio that they formed back in 2015 to create VR games. The studio's first game was never announced or seen, but clearly wasn't coming together as planned. Sony's official statement is that they are closing it as, quote, part of our efforts to improve efficiency and operational effectiveness, end quote. This is yet another sad turn for UK-based studios uh, as they follow Evolution's closer. So Evolution was the team behind Drive Club, and of course, on the, during the PS3 Gen Motorstorm, uh, they closed down in 2016 gorilla cambridge uh closed down in 2017 after they reformed as gorilla cambridge and their first game that came out was rigs for the vr uh, so sadly it looks like vr may have been the death knell for two different companies it's hard to say uh, a few other uk based closures in the last decade come in the way of big big studios and studio liverpool that both happened in 2012 as part of this restructuring and trying to sh shed off some weight it's a shame though it's Sony has closed off a lot of studios, but it's almost entirely affected UK more than anywhere else. Japan has seen the closure of very little stu studios. US has seen the closure of very little studios. One of the only ones being what Zipper Interactive. Um, so it, it's a shame, but it really makes me wonder why is it the UK ones that are getting shed off? Is it is it a cost thing? Are the other ones more viable because they're cheaper in terms of where they are to? pay the people and it the games are more viable because of that might be a cost thing i don't know like that's, that's what makes sense to me in my mind because it makes the most sense out of that i guess well we're, we're not in uk so it's like i'm trying to think like what are there any laws 
in, oh. in, in Europe that make this stuff more hard to like to, to keep afloat because of that to where at some point if a game is not making progress you kind of have to go we got to cut this because it's going to cost us too much before we can ever make out of this I don't know well and that's that also to me is um kind of weird because there's so many different financial laws in the UK versus the United States uh, especially weird odd ones that I, that I think is weird from the outside but makes sense on the inside there was something I heard the other day about something involving the pound, and I was like, "Oh, that that doesn't make sense. Why that would be a thing here, but you know, there's well, completely different." Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's that trying to look at something from another country within the context of what you understand from your own country does make this stuff interesting. So either way, it's unfortunate that the UK has been impacted so much by it, um, and it really makes me wonder if we've missed out on some otherwise would have been great games that would have eventually come to fruition. But at the same time, I understand not letting something run forever. You know, there's a there's a fine line to balance between there. Uh, if anybody was excited, Koi Tecmo's licensed fairy tale JRPG based off the anime has been delayed from its March 20th release to June 26th to further polish the game. Um, you know, whenever I was going through this news and, and saw that, it surprised me. And I don't know why I never th- thought about it. People complained throughout the PS3 generation for sure about uh, licensed products and how they were never that good. Yeah, I yet that. J- Japan has had for decades now n- licensed games that have done well, and it's just like it's a difference. It's almost like people don't look at anime licensed games in the same light they do like a TV show's licensed game, even though anime can be considered a TV show. It is or weird. a movie one. Yeah, it's almost like, like anime exists in its own little thing. Like, well, we're going to let that one be on its own legs speaking of anime games josh drago commented saying i was wearing a dragon ball z shirt last episode and he thought i hated dragon ball z i was talking about kakarot you dumb dumb not the show <laughs> i was talking about how kakarot didn't make sense to be that long well he said you were speaking the truth on something so i don't know if you read the youtube comment no i did that was there was two of them he said i was speaking the truth on one thing and then he said he saw wearing a dragon ball z shirt despite saying he hated it and i was like I hate, I, I hate the idea of kakarot I don't even hate the game. I've not played the game yet. But yeah, yeah I can't hate I just, something I've not played. I just don't like the idea of Kakarot. Uh, next up, despite Ubisoft's recent troubles causing them to delay games in order to maximize their potential, the publisher says it will release three AAA games during the last quarter of the year and two more in the first quarter of 2021. Coming from a recent earnings call, it seems the games will likely be shown at E3 as CEO Yves, Yves Guillemot <laughs> mentions... I don't know how to say that name, actually. Eves is right, I believe. Eves is right. Gilmot is, I don't know, uh, mentions the trade show being a good chance to demonstrate the quality of their lineup. They also confirmed that the long shown Beyond Good and Evil 2 will not be one of those games as it will not launch until at least April of 2021. I think that's, that's Gelamo. I was thinking about that, too. Or, you know, sometimes L's being together can do like a Gare. Yeah, Gare. See, but that's, that's, getting too, too, that's getting too close to that name. Yeah, I don't know. We'll but see. Yeah. If anybody knows, yeah, feel free to correct me. And if you're watching this CEO of Ubisoft, which I know you're not, then I'm even more sorry. See, now this one is the more I feel like, even though a publisher said it, it's going to be the rumor. Because yet, what was the what is the Ubisoft Pirates game? We, oh, Skull and Skull Bones. Skull and Bow. We still haven't gotten yet. That Wasn't game, that, and that game was delayed indefinitely. That game was delayed indefinitely. Yeah. So, so it could be part of that. It could have got to the point where now they know where it's going to go. But who knows? That could That could be a game that ends up being vaporware. But I'll play it for free. We, you know, we're going into Kingdom Hearts in the news. The thing that's funny about Vaporware is, have you been seeing all this stuff about Kingdom Hearts in terms of the stuff that Remind introduces and that there's thoughts that Yozora, the character introduced, is Noctis from Final Fantasy XIII versus I Nobody? Thought th- I thought that when I first well, saw him. Well, yeah, but they think it's his Nobody because he's wearing an earring that's got the Nobody symbol on it and it's the gray color of the Nobody thing. So they think that he And he has all the stuff and he says whenever he's walking up that this is not his normal form. It's not what he looks like. Um, what that wouldn't make sense canonically. This is why they're talking about though. So it'd be a real tongue in cheek way to do it. But what? When do you? When do you become a nobody? You have to. The, the nobody has to have a somebody, right? Right. So when would Noctis have come? When the game oh, got canceled. Bam, bam. That's stupid. I love it. Get it out of here. <laughs> Get it out of here. I love it so much. And so people were saying like... Uh, What's that meme? Like like you have a meme of me hating on Square, then then you saying that, and then just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. <laughs> I love it because it's not Square. It's Tetsuya Nomura being like, y'all canceled my game, it's you still, balls. Yeah, it's, but I was saying it's Square that canceled it, therefore it fueled this inspiration to he, Tetsuo. He, that's what I love about it. If this is a game that technically became vaporware that now... Is going to potentially see the light of day Wait, in a completely be- different. What fashion. game became vaporware? Uh, Final Fantasy Thirteen Versus. 
you know, is a game that we got shown tons and it never actually released. I thought vaporware was just the uh, was a phrase for a game, meaning that it's it's just cheap shovelware. It's like almost a shovelware. No, area. shovelware is shovelware. Vaporware right. is a game that is announced and you see it and everything, but it never actually comes. Oh, out. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So we may end up we we may end up seeing Final Fantasy Thirteen versus in some way yet. But Kingdom Hearts, I've already talked about this. This is the all in one package. Uh, and the thing that I didn't mention earlier is that the very attractive part of this is if you've never played Kingdom Hearts, you can get this all in one bundle for forty nine ninety nine. See, now that's different than what I was talking about. Oh, I know. I mean, it's fine, but also hold on. Let me ask you this though, because this is something I actually don't know. When did they change the ending of uh, fifteen? Was that at the? Was that how long ago after release was that? Because it came out in November. It's been so long. I want to say it was like three to five months after. Okay. Because, see, I, I just looked at it. I downloaded it on November 1st. And yeah. I think the release date for that was what? October something? Of- no, it was November something. Was it November 1st? No. It was oh, wait. November that might 1st. be. That might be when I. That's right. I bought it physically first. And then I bought it when it went on sale to try it again in a November sale right after Battlefield 1 had come out. We're going to find out. Because Battlefield 1 came out in November of. Wait, no, or am I mixing up? The game what? came out November 29th of 2016. Right, and I bought it November 1st for $40 or $30 on sale to try it out again. The I next had, year, 2017? I, I had already traded it in. Okay, fair enough. So I would have had the full, I would have had the fixed version then, right? Uh, probably, yeah. Okay. So if you would have just kept playing, you probably would have been all right. Well, that's what I got to uh, Autism. Mem- Memories of Celsetta. <laughs> <laughs> You got to a yeast game? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up, uh, PS Now's uh, game editions for February follow PS Plus with some simulation fun in the way of City Skyline, followed up by The Evil Within, and lastly, Lego Worlds. Crazy so, that that added some simulation, and then for PS Plus, we got Sims 4. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and both interesting games. I've seen them in very different shapes and forms, and I'm actually curious to play them, because I'm, I'm weird about buying those games, but I'm interested in them. Well, Annie loves The Sims, and she she downloaded Sims 4. She said that she hated it because it's a it's cursor-based on console. Oh, yeah. Sims 3 was as well. See, she's only played them on PC. She's yeah. only played them on her home computers. And they're, they're cursor-based on there as well. Well, yeah, but it's a keyboard and stuff. Yeah. Not the only controller. one that was not was Sims 2. On console, console, handheld. Yeah, Sims, I was like, handheld is Sims always. Herbs in the city. You just played that thing. Yeah. But my point being, yeah, I, I really, I wish that it would just let you move the thing around. But that also comes down to the way the Sims is done. Is it made for where you're following one character that you can flip between, or is it more that you're trying to take care of a whole family as an omniscient person? You know what I mean? Yeah. Or a whole group of people, rather. But either way. Earnings calls for Japanese publishers show good news for Capcom and Square Enix as the companies continue to see great profits due to Monster Hunter World, RE2 Remake, DMC5 on Capcom side, and Final Fantasy XIV Online and Dragon Quest Walk on Square Enix's side. Uh, Sega did not not enjoy a similar outcome with their recent releases underperforming, though they still have the Western release of Persona 5 Royal and the overall release of Yakuza 7 on the horizon uh, to hopefully turn some... uh, Excuse me. Turn it around a little bit. We'll see. We will see. Because the thing is, coming up on March, uh, the end of March is going to be the end of their fiscal year. Right. So we're for Japan, they're nine months into their fiscal year. So we'll see. Uh, next up on the manufacturer side of things, PS4 has reached 108.9 million units shipped, but is showing a significant drop year over year as the console prepares to be succeeded by PS5 later this year, potentially. One thing coming up is that there is a chance that the coronavirus thing going so wide in, in China will have an effect on console manufacturing. Uh, Nintendo is already saying it as well. What if that's what I have right now? Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway. I don't feel like that bad, though. Okay, that's not funny. I mean, I hope you don't have that. Point being, it can have an effect on everybody, whether you get the sickness or not. So here's the hope that those people get better. And um, who knows? We'll see Good what happens. Good luck to me, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, with... Uh, on top of that, though, talking about the PS5 coming later this year, uh, Sony mentioned an increase in game and network profits as Sony uh, is aiming to 
tra- transition to PS5 more smoothly internally, using an increase in profits to help the company remain more stable during the leap into the new generation. If you remember during the PS4 time going into it, they were kind of in an iffy spot still, uh, and the cost of research and development and getting the initial co- uh, systems out there and preparing all that was a big hit on Sony, and it kind of actually hurt their numbers but what they're aiming to do here is use their increase in these other sectors to try and somewhat buoy that so that it's a lesser of a hit for them uh while they're also trying to prepare for enough of enough ps5 consoles for the first wave of release so we'll definitely see what ends up happening um it's interesting i i'm It'll be interesting to see if their first year, we don't really see a net loss because of all this. Uh, and also, they, they talked about how they're not ready to um, talk about price on the console just yet, which may lend some credence to the whole uh, community state question about whether or not it comes. Saul was saying that he thinks it comes later. Uh, they said that the price is such a balancing act uh, between different things and competition and looking at how much things are going to cost that they're being... They're holding their cards close to their chest and they're going to wait. And it sounds like there's a chance that they're looking for someone else, potentially Microsoft, to come out with a cost first before they reveal theirs. It wouldn't be the craziest thing. You know, if you know that Microsoft's coming up as an actual, as far as Sony's concerned, as a chance of, uh, of a competition this generation, then the concern would be, well, if the Xbox Series X is more powerful than us, which we don't know yet, nobody knows, uh, maybe Sony has some idea but if that's the case and they come out the same price as us, then if we go ahead and announce, like say that Sony says our system's $500 and they think that that's great because on the Series X side, they're like, well, if, if it is more powerful, it's going to be at least a little bit more money, right? But then if Microsoft comes and says, we're going to take the hit and just have it to where Xbox Series X is $500, then Sony would be like, crap. So I think Sony's waiting so that they don't have to look cowardly by are not even cowardly. They don't have to look like they're only responding to Xbox afterwards by saying the PlayStation 5 is 500, coming back later and saying, what's well, 450 or it's 400. I've actually thought of that about how, how much Sony took a loss on their consoles early this gen or early or late last year. I mean, yeah, um, I actually thought about that. What if Xbox just did that move and then they announced the Xbox one X will go down to 299 and then the series X will be 399. I actually think the one X, uh, I'm surprised they haven't. It's been on perpetual sale for 350 for a while. I'm surprised that it's not just, has been considered a price drop. I don't know if this is a marketing thing to where they're wanting to look at it and say people will be more likely to buy it if they think they're getting more of a deal on it. Like, man, it's on sale. I'm getting this $500 console for $350. That may just be a marketing move. It's actually, now you, now you think about it, you brought that up. It's, I haven't seen a console not on sale any console in a long time playstation 4 pro right now is still back is back down to its 299 black friday price but it's not been on sale constantly. well it seems like anytime and, and granted i don't go to like best buy or walmart often but like anytime i go by target there are always sale tags on those things in the display cases everything but obviously switch and even switch they have like free game here and there but it's weird that that the that this kind of trend is happening where they're on sale but yeah, I was thinking in my head the other day. I was like, "Well, Sony's waiting for Microsoft to uh, announce a price. What if they announce three ninety nine? Like, like what? Like what then? Like, will we see them a week later unveil something? And then because because if if Microsoft's going to hit take a hit that hard, would be crazy. Because I we saw what, we saw how Sony used it to their advantage in a way. I wonder how if if Microsoft even could afford to do that. In I think they head, could, but it would just not be to the benefit of the business, considering yeah. they're also, in some ways, they're not losing money necessarily if you look at the stuff, but they are they are investing by, in a very odd sense of the word, but they are investing in their services by letting people get three months of Games Pass for a dollar. Yeah. Like They're still making money on it, but they could be making more, obviously, and the hope right now is that they're investing by letting people get the thing at a, at a, bare, at a minimized cost they're hoping that it puts more people onto the service at the actual cost. That way they make more money off of it. So I guess it's one of those in between things where they could be, they could do that if if they're not even projecting the console to sell that much because they're going to leverage more of the existing Xbox ones and the series X together. Like they're talking about, it's possible. It would be really surprising. It'd be very, very And I I just now realized something else too. That I don't know is for better or for worse, but essentially an Xbox now, just any Xbox is pretty much a Windows 10 machine, just very modified. More can, or less. Can Microsoft fall back on their Windows division since it's essentially kind of in the same thing? Well, what do you mean fall back? So, like, let's say um, the Xbox games division itself is losing money. Does... does oh, Microsoft as a whole buoys them. 
Right. Doesn't matter. I know, yeah. but I'm saying like Sony doesn't have that kind of so, dual Sony, side Sony has in. Sony. Well, I mean, no, it's still, saying, you go but, from a parent company. They, that's really essentially what they do. But Sony's not using another one of their divisions in a, as a factor into their consoles. Well, so the Windows division right? doesn't. So their Xbox division actually is considered a Windows and Xbox because they do their games on there. But that doesn't mean that the Windows development team, any of the money from them goes over to them necessarily. Well, uh, I don't know for sure, but well, I mean, it doesn't necessarily it, mean that Xbox it, is already considered the, the game side of P of windows is Xbox. So that's already tied into the window. So, side so it's it. already tied into it that way. So yeah. even then they don't have anything technically lean back on to even do that. Cause I, that's what I mean. It, they both have their parent companies and how much their parent companies want to go through them. But the more finer details, nobody knows really. Okay. Cause see, I mean, like that's, not, not an average consumer. I'm sure someone knows. Well, but. See, that's what I was thinking is that technically Xbox is, is in a, dual relationship with Microsoft with being into the windows division too. Yeah. So now I was thinking about it cause Sony doesn't really develop anything else uh, in terms of that would go with a console like that. So like in my head, I was trying to rationalize something of like, if Microsoft said three ninety nine, how would they fall back on that? If they, if you know, they didn't sell or if they, it they wouldn't could, be that drastic. Let's just say, you know, if it is more powerful, what they're talking I about, know. I think that, I think what they would do is they would match PlayStation, even though they're more powerful because then you get to go, Hey, we're the same price, but we're this much more powerful, well, the way which we're is looking, essentially when you look at the game thing, uh, PlayStation had the benefit of being a hundred dollars cheaper and more powerful. But that was also right. because the cost for the Xbox One when it launched, the, a lot of the cost came into the camera that they were dying the hill on. Yeah. Once they cut that, they were able to get the cost down to 400 a lot quicker. So my, my point being is that a lot of the times, they'll, they'll take up to 100s, but let's say that the system really should be 600 if they were going to make, you know, try and, and make it reasonable where it's a, where it's got a profit line for them somewhere in it. Um, taking a drop of $200 is, is massive. Now, PlayStation did it at the beginning of PS3, Consoles that took them almost nine hundred dollars to build that they were selling for six hundred dollars. They That's did a it at massive the end drop. for PS3 too, didn't they? No, it, I mean it was still there, but it wasn't that drastic. No, no, but by, it was that, a loss. by that time, yeah, the console I don't think was ever at a profit. Yeah, um, where well, the PS4 was, and if I remember yes, reading correctly, day one. it wasn't. But it was very little. It was like eighteen cents day one, or eighteen bucks day one. It was like yeah, that. it was eighteen bucks. So I was gonna say twenty, but yeah, eighteen bucks actually sounds like what it was. So it's a difference in the way things are set up. Regardless, it's interesting to see all this stuff going on because you're right. There's different divisions there, but PlayStation is Sony's biggest thing. Right. PlayStation is the thing that saved Sony from bank from almost from bankruptcy. You know, well not, essentially, from being constantly in. Well, uh, they, they were getting ready to file for ba- uh, for bankruptcy, weren't they? I don't know about that, but I do remember that they just were year over year loss, 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 and then PlayStation was able to turn them around and bring them back into the black as a whole company. But I, I think what they did was they sold their laptop line to somebody they, else. They sold via yeah. Uh, and then they've sold a number of things in. often here and there, but they've kept a lot of it as well. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see if Sony has, or really PlayStation as a whole uh, has any kind of significant losses due to this. And if Microsoft does, I mean, really you could be onto something, but I just, I don't know. It seems weird. I mean, technically they both have their parent companies to fall back on. And I think that that'd be what they'd really do, but I don't think Sony needs to. And realistically PlayStation is Sony's, driving market leader they did file for bankruptcy in 2014 okay there we go now we know and then it was Kaz or i uh i mean i know Kaz was the one who brought them back to profitability yeah but. huh one more thing in the news and we'll go ahead neo 2 is on the way but the first is still enjoying success as it hits three million copies sold kinda so congratulations game, to kind of took that game a little long to hit that miles it did i would have thought that game would have hit that much more much sooner well it was a more niche exclusive you know it just was uh, and it came to PC, and so even the PC numbers are folded into that. I wouldn't. Well, is that is that really a niche of a game? Neo? Yeah. I mean, in more so than, you know, think about it this way. Uncharted, all these other games, even Bloodborne, you're hitting millions upon millions of copies sold. For Neo to hit 3 million this long later after it also got ported to PC, it's more of a niche game. It's not well, it took, just niche, but I mean, it's not like 200,000 copies niche, but well, it's, I, clearly it's not the same type of exclusive. It's not the same big budget, ridiculous excuse, exclusive you see Sony push really hard. It's something that Sony's pushing and using a benefit because it's also not first party. I no, mean, you know. So. But, but, but I would argue that Nier is more, arguably more niche. Didn't it hit two million after six months? Near, yeah, yeah. Near's, Near's doing well. I think it's no, fine. no. I know, but I'm saying it, it, within two months they hit two or six months they hit two million. Yeah. Or it might have been sooner than that. No, I mean, it was yeah, it was pretty early on. I mean, they've been steadily climbing. 
but niche is becoming such a weird thing in gaming anyways. Is well, that- what, what it comes down to is, and, and you know, there was that famous line that I want to say it might have been Jim Ryan that said, if not, it was Konichi, uh, Konichiro Yoshida or whoever. Uh, somebody at Sony or PlayStation rather said that gaming as a whole, console gaming as a whole, I think is actually what they said, is a niche. And it is. Even though it's where, you know, gaming in general is a lot of money, but realistically speaking across gaming as a whole more people play games on phones than they do on consoles yeah when you you, really look at those numbers people don't look at it as core gamers or what the money is but in the long run yeah i mean gaming from the console side of things as a whole is more niche than anything else it's just kind of but because niche is really looking at it if you're if you're niche you're essentially the you're a smaller part of the market than something else doesn't mean that's still not successful it's just you know Console gaming is probably 30 to 40% of the gaming business, if even that, across phones and computers. So it's just different. I mean, I think it's that, like, you know, the idea of what we look at and say, well, even though they're playing games on phone, they're not playing real games, or maybe they're free to play games. And there's a lot of different things that we see it differently, but realistically, it's all gaming. I so am curious. niche is a weird word. But have you seen the meme going around about uh, a specific mobile game that's been, ad, uh, been heavily supported in ads on YouTube? No. Raid Shadow Legends. I had a feeling that's what you're talking about, but How would it? you how would you not have heard that then you had a feeling that was what I was talking about? Well, I thought you were saying that did I hear about the troubles they were having. No, 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 no. I'm talking about like have you heard the memes? Oh yeah. Um this game has six hundred and fifty not ninety five thousand downloads on Google Play alone. Six hundred and ninety five? Thousand. That's not that much. That's that's what do you mean? That's not that much. That's a that's massive for a mobile game. I mean, yeah, on but one platform. That surprised me. I wonder what it'd be across everything else. Well, they have Steam and Apple, so. Hmm. Huh. I wonder if I can um, if I could find out. I but saw. Yeah. I just realized what time it is. We got I hate to be this person this time. I have a baby shower for my sister to go to. Um, so. For your sister. Yes. She's having another baby. Kyron, my other sister. Oh, so like congratulations from somebody she does not know because I don't know who that is. <laughs> uh, but you haven't met her. She just recently moved back into town. Gotcha. So anyway, um, with that said, we're going to go ahead and get into the the thing. And you know what? Saul is the one who um, who, who got there. So I'm going to let Saul do it because we in the news, did you take it off? No, here it is. I nope. skipped it. I knew I did. You skipped it for a reason. Okay. So there's always been this long debated conversation within the Kickstarter realm. And that is, should big names be, or be using that platform to fund things? And it's mainly heavily debated because a lot of the times you get people who have directed movies like Zach Braff is a good example. He wanted to kickstart a movie on there and people were criticizing him saying like, you know, you are Zach Braff, you know, go get you, uh, go and get this movie funded through a studio. You, you have a name attached to your person. They're going to fund you that way. Don't have your fans funded. And you know, Kickstarter has been a great platform and bad platform in a sense for funding games. You look at mighty number nine, the game was funded on Kickstarter and you saw the way it came out. But then you have cool stores like this, and that is that Wonderful 101, for those that don't remember, was a Wii U exclusive made by Capcom and... Um, Wasn't Capcom. Was it not Capcom? I no. thought Capcom owned the company who made that game. Platinum Games? It's not owned by Capcom. Platinum not Games Not Platinum is, Games, no. I thought, I thought it was made by the same person who made Beautiful Joe. No, it's, well, it's made by people who used to work for Capcom. That's what it was. Platinum okay. Games is entirely made a, up of people who used to work at Capcom. Okay. I, okay. That's, that's why de- their first game, Bayonetta, was a Devil May Cry style game. Yeah. So yes. that's that's where the correlation came from. But it is it is a, a beat 'em up style game that was a exclusive to Switch, had its own perfect little uh, niche fan base. There we go, using that word again. But um, within two and a half hours, it broke through a $500,000 stretch goal to bring the game to PS4 on Kickstarter. And it currently sits at just one and a half million dollars within five days of going up to Kickstarter. And, you know, that's always an interesting conversation to have is that this is a Platinum Games game. And Platinum 
Games has tons and tons of money. Buku's of money. You, you go look at how many how many copies of Astral Chain that got sold that they got their cut from. Well, the Bayonetta series. This ties back into something that's actually really important. So the, the, it, this actually follows their announcement earlier in January that they were going to start exploring self publishing earlier this year. The reason that these things are tied up is that these are franchises that were published by Nintendo. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this one in particular. And they're even talking about Bayonetta. They said that they'd love to self-publish Bayonetta, but it would take way more money to do it. Uh, but this follows that that statement about self-publishing uh, came after Tencent fu- brought into funding them, uh, just like they did everybody else. So and I could see that honestly because I've heard you know everybody knows that Tencent is not the most noble of companies in the world, to put it very lightly. <laughs> so I could see that they may have had some problems, and this is kind of their solution to getting on their own again without having to worry about Tencent uh, because Tencent runs a lot of things in video games. Well, Tencent and, is actually part of the reason that they're going after this. This is extra money that they're getting to want to do stuff like this. Right, but I'm And sh- this is Tencent funding them on top of letting fans do it because of how much the cost is to go, hey, Nintendo, we want to buy that IP back so that we can publish it ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Or we want to at least buy the licensing rights for us to publish it ourselves on another uh, platform. Right. So, you know, money eventually speaks to the biggest thing. And it goes to show you how much different this was. So the stretch goals for this was fifty thousand dollars to get it to come to switch yep. because nintendo didn't want to fund it right and it broke but then it was two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to get it on pc and then lastly five hundred thousand to get it on ps4 and so then, it goes to show there's definitely a market for this right and and in less than three hours it hit it yeah. so uh it kind of brings up the question of is it more like for me at least is it morally correct to use this as a platform when you are an already self-established company or even person in the gaming industry that can go and get your own outlet. You can go to any kind of publisher or go to any kind of game label and say, Hey, I want to make this game. Here's my story. But then where I don't always agree with that notion because it's like what Zach Braff did. He wanted to go to Kickstarter to make a movie. I don't think that Zach Braff should have done that. Zach Braff could have gone to a, uh, any kind of major motion picture label gone to them, pitched the movie, and gotten the budget that way without having to have fans fund it. For this, though, this is kind of in the same realm. And now that I'm older, I can kind of see where this can actually make sense. They're not having to uh, always take word-for-word changes on their games from their publisher or from anybody who's working on the game with them because their fans are the ones that are paying for it. The problem is that when the fans pay for it, you are essentially pre-ordering a game times 10 with Kickstarter. You are helping fund the game. And most times with Kickstarters, they'll have a tier listing where you will purchase the game essentially as, as part of donating. Sure. And that that's a kind of a cool thing there too, is it's going to show you that it's going to show that people bought them. Hey, like this guy went to the $50 tier or whatever it was and said, Hey, that guy there bought the game. And we have 16,000 of these people. So we know we've sold 16,000 copies. Yes. It's a very safe way for them to get off the ground and take that money to develop the game. But you get games like I brought up earlier with mighty number no. nine, where that is a, very very bad example of what kickstarter should be used for the game launched in such a wild mess the the, so many problems with that game and people were so let down ukulele to an extent too was launched in such a wild mess while being crowdfunded and people disliked ukulele ukulele stating that the open world was or that the i say open world but that the world was empty and that it wasn't you know it wasn't as banjo inspired as it was supposed to have been so it kind of goes into that of it, it. I think that this is going to change, but it's all for me in this in this sense is that it's going to be a person to person basis, and, and I think per, that, person to person makes it like a consumer to consumer basis or or I think game in, creator to individual game basis. individual consumer to consumer. Okay, because that way, you know, game we both backed a game still not even out yet, mm-hmm. but um, pray still to looking the gods. great though. Yeah, pray to the gods. Still not out yet, but. We both backed it almost two years ago. Hmm? Actually, no, it was two years ago. Probably more than that, actually. Um, you might be right. Uh, but yeah, and we still haven't gotten that game yet. So this is coming from somebody who's done it. and I've, I've done it once or twice. Once with a game and I bought back something else. And I can't remember what that was. Cause 2016, it's been four years almost. Four years. July 2016. It just shows you how fast the world goes by. I still kept thinking Final Fantasy 15 came out two years ago. Yeah. Um, but... But yeah, still not. We don't have that game. We got a beta for it. I never really got a chance to play the beta um, for this. I didn't have time. It's good. Yeah, it's, good. Um, it's still available. 
It doesn't. That code does not kill until that the game code releases. Did, oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I still have that email buried deep, deep somewhere. I can search for it. Um, but because uh, you got the you got the PS4 beta, I got the PC beta. No, there is no PS4 beta. It's just PC beta. Yeah, but okay. I I emailed them and said, hey, I have the PS4 version, but I have a computer that can play it, and they just sent me the code. Oh, okay. But um, but yeah, so I think that it kind of comes down to uh, each person individually. You know, is there a game? Bloodstain was fun on Kickstarter, and Bloodstain yep. it was critically received as as an amazing game for everything but the Switch, and they're still working on that right now to this day to fix it if they haven't already. I did hear a couple weeks ago that they're still getting patches out for the game on Switch. So, so to lend credence to what you're talking about, and I, I, I really I don't want to interrupt. So, do you have anything else you want to finish off with? That? Oh no, I was just saying that I think that the topic lends well for an open discussion among people because it's it's something that I think that everybody will have a slight difference of an opinion on too. Mm-hmm. Like it'll be a, sli- a slight reason why they think that that they should or shouldn't, and then I think that everybody can can say that there are examples on why you should be able to do it. I think that, or, or not even why you should, but why you could. And I think that um, you have great examples of that, like with Bloodstained. And, you know, th- these are examples that that work well, but then you have bad examples like Mighty Number no. 9. So I think it's almost a very balanced ground on using this service. I do think that there is still a moral question, though, of... of these are established companies with tons of revenue and they're going to fans to fund a game. And I think that that kind of can change on a person to person basis too, because most of the time companies are going to be different. If, if platinum wants to kind of get out of 10 cent helping them because 10 cent ultimately has a say in the game and they don't want 10 cent say to change direction of the game or anything like that, then yeah, that makes sense. Um, but well, okay. So to kind of depack, or, you know, to go through a lot of that, um, one of the things I was really wanting to say immediately is to lend credence to some of your worries about Kickstarter. As much as uh, as much as Ritual Bloodstained Ritual of the Night ended up coming out and being a well received game, it was a game uh, that prior to its release was actually constantly be p- people who were worried about what the fact that they had backed it because it had been delayed a number of times. Oh and yeah, it had consoles. It was originally supposed to release on Vita, and that version got cut. Yeah. The game that people were playing the beta about six months before the game came out were like, "Well, it just doesn't look right." Didn't and all. All of that was fixed for every console besides Switch, clearly, yeah. by the time the game released. So that's really that's one of those weird examples of a game that really that really towed the whole line of the Kickstarter experience. It was it, well received to begin with because it's something people have been wanting that they were never going to get. And I think that's the that's the crux of I should say this right now. So whereas you stand, more often than not, do you think people should or should not go or creators should or should not lean on Kickstarter? I think it's a case by case basis. Okay. I think that if I saw, oh, something- I should say this. Okay, let me let me back up a little bit. Instead of it just being creators, I think it's, I want to go back to one thing that you said because I think I have the answer, but I do want to clarify. If you are an already established creator, do you think they should or should not go to Kickstarter if they more have, often than not? If they have a good reason, like getting like getting the money to help fund a license that they have lost or to get out of a deal with another company like platinum and Tencent. So the Tencent thing is not them trying to back out. They just recently talked about Tencent. That re- Tencent just invested in them in January. So they're not trying to get away from Tencent. All that happens here, Tencent's helped giving them more money so they can grow and they can help because platinum was not doing right. very well prior to near. Um, actually near is the game that saved them. Yeah. Uh, and then of course, Atlas uh, or astral chain did very well for them as well. So they're on the upswing. Um, this is something that the extra funding allows them to have that to do. So, for, for where I stand on it, kind of looking at some of the stuff you're talking about, you know, it's really easy. And I think people looking like going back to your Zach Braff uh, example, right? I think people look at people who are already somewhat established and go, hey, wait a minute. You have a name. You can go to a studio and get them to fund your, your movie game or whatever. The, the problem with that comes down to when you go to someone else and ask them for funding, they inevitably get a hand in what you can or can't do. Right. A lot of the reason that I think creators have this mindset towards going, hey, I'm going to take this directly to the people who want it. They're going to go ahead and buy it. Like you talked about the beauty of it being an instant sale. You do know, like once you back something, the person looks at it and goes, we know we at least sold this one copy. We're not, not always because there could be lower tiers that don't include the game. Sure. But essentially if you're backing it within that level, for the right. most part, you're looking at it of if they've backed at a level that 
comes and you always the backing level for that's great because it's always cheaper than you'd otherwise pay for it. Yeah. And so I, like I Pray for the earlier. Gods is supposed to be like a forty or sixty dollar PS4. And the backing game, was twenty. And I paid twenty dollars for mm-hmm. it. And that's great. But that's and that's what I brought up earlier. Is or thirty. That it was thirty. It, but it's it's ten dollars. Sure? Yeah, for the PS4 version. The, the Steam version is twenty. The PS4 right, version, well, there's more cost involved. Okay. Then maybe but, that's what it was. Uh, anyway, going into that. Um, but that's I brought that up earlier, is that, that when that tier is, 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 when somebody purchases from the tier that includes the game, that's going off of already purchased yes. game, and that's yes. what they can use for their advantage. We already have 30,000 people who have bought this Exactly, game. whereas most games exist in the thing of, we can make a game that technically no one would buy. That's why I said it's almost an, an advanced version of pre-order, yeah. in a way. So, But going through that, you know, back to the, the Zach Braff and like different creators saying, a lot of the reason that... Like, like on the movie thing, right? It could be that Zach Braff wanted to make a movie that he did not have enough money to fund on his own, but going to a studio means that they would have dabbled too much into it. By going to the fans and cutting out the middleman, he can go, hey, do you like me and you like the work I've done? All right, so you know that one movie that I did that I did get funded with a very minimal thing? If you like that, I want to make another movie where I'm completely in control, but I can only do that if I get funding from a source that is not... Somebody who can go, hey, I paid for 57% of this movie. I want this to be done or I'm going to pull my funding. You know, that stuff can happen and or the worry of that can happen. And some people like to exist and operate going into a project and saying the idea from this project from the ground up is that I'm only beholden to the people who want to experience this as the end product, not anybody who's only in it for the money that they're going to get out of it. So that, when you look well, at that. Yeah. It does let somebody like Zach Braff go, hey, I really, I, th- I have a great idea for a movie that I don't think I'd be able to get enough funding for from a studio and or without enough dabbling, one of the two, uh, and go, hey, now I'm going to make this movie because you guys are going to help pay for it. So then flipping over to the game thing, you know, the Bloodstained thing for me is a hugely great example of it. Um, People have been asking for new Castlevania-like games for a long time. And one of the biggest things that people wanted for a long time was, hey, can we get another game that's in the vein of, uh, of Castlevania Symphony of the Night, right? So Iga leaves and goes off and do, is doing his own thing, and he thinks about it. He goes, you know what? I can make my own version of a Metroidvania game again like I did and have a game that's very much inspired by what I did on Symphony of the Night. But since companies are not wanting to fund that because they don't think that it's enough money in it, what if I go to Kickstarter and say, hey, if you believe in this idea enough and this is something you really want, then you fund it. Doesn't I don't have to rely on a company to tell me no because they don't think there's enough money in this idea or to go, well, we'll do it, but only if you add a multiplayer com- a component because that's where the money's going to be. Or, hey, we'll do it, but only if you add this much microtransactions. The idea yeah. from it stems from the point of, it's an idea I love, right? It's the same thing as Patreon, right? People yeah. come to our Patreon and they look at us and they say, you know what? I like this show. Everything that they do is not beholden to any podcast network, any kind of company. It's just two guys that are getting together for this show and doing what they want to do. And I like what they're doing and I want to help directly fund that so that they have less reason to go off and try and find money from sponsorships or whatever elsewhere. Right? So we constantly go through that. It's people going, I like what they're doing. I want to support that directly because I enjoy it. And they do it. And at any given point, the podcast could fall from the quality they like and they could always stop supporting it. But I enjoy that aspect of it. And that's something I really love about the idea. Oh, God. It's the Hard Times article. E3 Bouncer assures Cliff Bozinski he's already checked the guest list three times. (laughs) But, uh, yeah, that's my favorite thing about Kickstarter. You know, like, and I, I'm very selective about what I do and don't back. I, I, I truly am. Uh, and Indiegogo exists in a similar thing. I have funded every one of Jared Alonge's uh, musical projects because I love them. I think they're hilarious, and I want to see him keep doing them. Well, see, that's the sad part now is that he's probably not going to. Well, but he's decided he he no longer wants to do it, and that's fine. I've already seen it. Right. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, it's just one of those things where you should read that article. Actually, <laughs> is it good? Yeah. I like this. I love anybody who likes a good laugh. Go go to the hardtimes.net. Yeah, they're great. Um, but I do, it, I do think though that there is one major downfall to this. People already blame pre order games, pre ordering games, to uh, attribute to a factor of games that are having bad features, microtransactions, shady DLC stuff because they think it's something close to a guaranteed buy even though it's really not. Kind it's of, closer. Yeah. It's like, yeah, well, hey, yeah. we at least know that these, this many people are You can take a percentage of them and say, the, this percentage is going to buy the game. Yeah, at least this percentage. Yeah. With kickstarting uh, a game, that can be a similar thing where, where you can get a game. Say if you kickstarted um, Bloodstain and you were only on Switch. Well, you got it and it launched like crap. You feel bad about that because you, you're the one that helped play for this game. And now it's... In a state that's not really playable. 
but you're getting told that it's going to get fixed. So, hey, that's fine. So we'll go to an extreme example. Say Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order has nothing to do with EA or anything this next time around. It's just sure. a respawn breaks off and we, and we kickstart it ourselves. We get it. It runs at less than 30 frames per second. Uh, the game's constantly crashing. Um, you know, the, get the story doesn't make sense. It's terribly written. Say the game just launches in a massive mess. Who do you blame? Because at that, at, at that point, you feel like you should blame respawn because it is their fault for that. But then there are so many people that attributed to this. People blame people for pre-ordering games all the time for the way they launch. Is that going to start changing where people are going to get blamed for paying for the game to be created and then the game coming out with a mess so we're going to see games like like or we're going to hear about things like bethesda and ea you know or you don't pre-order these games but companies can very well go down a dark track where they're gonna, you're gonna hear the same thing about kickstarter they're, if this ever becomes something in mainstream you're gonna hear you know oh hey go 3g studios or somebody like that's a name i made up so if you're 3g studios i'm not talking about you um <laughs> you know don't don't kickstart them because they launch these three games and they're all they're all broken you know i sure. think that it, it, it's, I think a, it's a standard marketplace i mean at that point is. yeah anytime you buy any product you're risking it not being as good as you wanted it to now the the inherent difference between pre-ordering a game and, and backing a game is that most of the time you're backing a game when it's still in the conceptual standpoint most of the time that you're pre-ordering a game you're pre-ordering a game that's already far enough in development that at least you're able to see very a, a lot of what the real gameplay is aiming to be and closer to a final final product some not games all, not most of the time not, not always not, not always not even most of the time. But, I've seen teaser trailers go up for a game, and then those pre-orders go live the next day. I'm pretty sure you can go oh, pre-order. Yeah. You but can, again, they, they don't tend to announce games. And, again, tend to. There are yeah. always examples. of There are already outliers. Uh, but ten, most of the time, you're going to pre-order something when it's already at a state where it's like, okay, well, we know we're at least very, very likely to release this. Right. You know, Kickstarter is all about a wing and a prayer. It's about going, hey, here's my wild idea. I think it's great. Obviously, I can't do it myself, and I don't have the means to go to a publisher, or it's something that a publisher wouldn't be interested in because they don't see the monetary value in it. But say that you like farming games, right? Well, uh-huh. then guess what? You're going to be able to kickstart directly Stardew Valley, and I'm going to be able to do this. And that, that Stardew Valley is not a Kickstarter game, actually. Stardew Valley was just somebody who worked in... And all of his free time. It was one person. And, and he, well, actually, he worked and then he didn't work. And then his girlfriend, again, it, it's the true, uh, true bootstrap story, as they call him. But uh, good for him. He's doing really well now. Uh, but point being, yeah, I, I see your point. I think that the blame does fall back onto the developer because the developer at that point becomes a self publisher. I don't think that anybody would ever go to somebody and go, hey, it's your fault for trying to back a game that was just an idea that you really liked. And I don't think, I mean, to me, there's of course going to be people who eventually do it because there's just buttholes uh, well, I mean, you galore get that in the pre-ordering. world. Pre-ordering. Yeah. Pre-ordering, the people pre-ordering the game is not and, responsible for and the, no, they're the not. game and I think that that's such a dumb argument. When people go, people pre-ordering these games while this game got so messed up. No, it's someone trying to positively go into something that, that looks like they'd enjoy it and go, I'm going to pre-order it because first of all, I want it. It just guarantees I get a copy. And Which is, maybe, that's bull crap. I hate that. I hate that. That's the artificial, oh, if I don't get, if I don't pre-order it, oh, yeah. I'm not going to no, get But it. it still does guarantee that they hold a copy for at least a small period. Yeah. Whereas any other time, you can run into the same problem I have where I go to GameStop two days after games release and I didn't pre-order it. That's, well, so that's GameStop the artificial no problem. Copies. That's GameStop doing that Yeah, no, it is. When you go to Walmart, there's an end cap full of those games. Well, and I went to Walmart for Greedfall and they only had one copy left. So so That's a it, double A game. Though. It goes to show you that they, well, both of the times that GameStop happened, they were double A games. It was a Plague Tale, uh, and they, they had one copy that they were holding for an employee. Annoyed Did, me to no end. Oh, I'm pretty sure that's what happened with that back uh, that back adapter for the P- PS4 controller. They have one. Probably, he says they have, he's like, we got what's for it. He's probably holding it for himself. But. Uh, we, we do got to wrap this up because I got to get going. But with that, I mean, I, I personally, I love the idea of Kickstarter because to me, it's the ultimate example of if you really want to see something made, then this is the ultimate vote with your wallet. See, yeah. And I think, and I know it's, it's a vote with your wallet on the completely different swing. This is not about not spending money on something that's not hitting your thing. This is about spending money upfront on something that you just really want to believe in. And there is a chance you'll get burned and you have to weigh those options in your head every time before you click back. And I do that every time. And that's why I've only Kickstarter started probably four things in total maybe five but i'm very selective on it and even though bloodstain looked great i was a little worried i said well maybe, maybe it won't come out like i thought and you know what i was wrong and i paid more for it later and 
at least I still got the game. But yeah. I don't mind letting someone go out and say, you know what, I really like this and I believe in these people and this idea. I just want to go ahead and support it. And best case scenario, I get a really great game out of it. Worst case scenario, I let people try and go through their dream and I may end up getting a less than what I wanted experience. And you know what? You, you already take a chance on everything that you spend money on. Why not take a chance on something that's still in its, think, in its early stages? I think the biggest problem that some people have is that it's the turnaround from when you see the, 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 you see the product of your, of your money. So it's like, okay, normally when you buy something or go ahead and put money down on something, like it's pre-order. Most people don't pre-order full price though. You, you have to, if you do it digitally, but the money's not already taken up. Kickstarter, they take the money as soon as the com the, uh, the campaign closes. So within that first month, if you if you back it, your money can be taken, and you will not see the product of that until the game is complete. We don't see the product of Pray for the Gods or Pray to the Gods until maybe mid this year, maybe. Yeah. Who knows? And that means that we've been waiting four and a half years for that, and that's yeah. fine because I believe in the idea, and I don't think anyone else is going to make that game. That's I, just kind of the that's what, when I was going through. I said, you know what? You know, how many people have been asking for a Shadow of the Colossus style game for years. Uh, a spiritual successor to it. And we have this group of people, three people at the time. And I think they've grown very, very little, but three people at the time going through and going, we really want to make this game happen. We have a great idea for it. What do you think? And I just, I, to me, it's one of those great things where it's like, I already give people money for things that I, like, if I see somebody doing something and I'm like, you know, they're doing good. I want to give them the money to help them out. I do it all the time. Well, my thing is, it's like kind of this, this whole conversation, this part of it, Kickstarter already exists in a nice way for people who have big ideas that can't fund anything because they're, sure. they're, they don't have the name for it. And, and for me, I think that the Kickstarter is the perfect place for these passion projects. I'm thinking more of when evil can go afoot into this this nice, del delicious land. And that it always is, can happen. That is Bethesda starting to kickstart games. It, it can and, always happen. Yeah. And, that's, and, that's, you know? that's, that's more of my thing of like... There has to be a balance there. That's why I right? said it's a it's a it's a it's a case by case by case scenario on this kind I, of thing. I think that is the best way to word it. Is yeah. It's always case by case. I mean, you look from the game, the, from the creators, you choose who you trust enough to go into this. If it, if you want to give it to people who have a great idea, who have no name in the game industry yet, or if you want to give it to a group of people who you know have a name in the game industry, but the idea that they want to sell you or that they want to make is not something that would be funded in, in any other way, just do it. You know, but everything needs to be that you weigh the options of everything and, and see and first of all realize that you can always lose money on this you can always spend money that you wish you wouldn't have spent but you know that's that's part of life you gotta you gotta see you will always regret some things in life but you know that doesn't mean you don't do anything yeah so and that's the community state question what is your general consensus consensus on kickstarter games and have you ever kickstarted a game? I, out of curiosity, I just want yeah. to see which one. So, uh, and did it change your opinion? We'll kind of word that all into one much better thing. But with that said, I got to get out of here. We love you guys. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Brett. Read the patrons. Thanks to our patrons, Dan Barber, Josh Jarrell, Matthew Green, my name is Dan, Douglas Below, Sean Sanarud, Eric McAllister, Matt Sycamore, Funk Turkey, Danny Villalobos, Shadowist, Steven Salazar, The Stoner, Travis Below, Eduardo Palomino, Stefan Swanlin, Coy Live, Philip Laguerre, Corey Hickerson, Solitary Red, Brian, Donovan Williams, William Digital Spooker, Derek Porter, Josh Ayers, Brandon Edwards, Sean One Neo, Tyler Powers, Dylan Kirby, and Sankoff is actually no longer a patron at this particular moment but I forgot to take his name off so shout out to my boy um, screw you Chad <laughs> love you guys we will see you guys next week thanks I love you Chad <laughs>